Psycho Farm. So for this video, I want to talk about Piaget's stages of cognitive development. I feel like people view these developmental stages as really annoying and tough to memorize. And I don't want to be annoying, but um, I actually think if you view it less as a annoying thing you have to memorize and more as a really useful concept that makes sense when you think about it, it becomes interesting and easy to memorize. For this video, I'm just going to be going over the basics and the things that are tested, but hopefully eventually I'll be making a more extensive video that goes deeper into the concepts. So this is the chart that you need to kind of have down in order to get all the test questions right. So what I'm trying to say is let's not try to memorize this through brute force, but let's actually think about what they're trying to say here. So the core of what's trying to be shown through these stages of cognitive development is that there are certain cognitive concepts that tend to develop at certain ages and that those cognitive concepts are vital for what the child can cognitively grasp and how the child makes sense of the world. So before we even jump into the cognitive aspects, let's just look at the age ranges for the different stages. So we see zero to two, so that's like an infant, two to seven, seven to 11, and then 11 years older. And I can't help but notice that this almost perfectly maps on to the education levels. And this makes sense when you think about it because depending on what the child can cognitively understand, you're gonna give them different educational material to fit their understanding. So I think of the age ranges as zero to two, so you have infant, then they move on to essentially preschool, so before kindergarten, so that's two to seven, and then you have elementary school, and that's seven to 11, and then they move on to middle school and high school, so that's 11 years and older. So to memorize this chart, I actually picture an infant, a preschooler, a middle schooler, and then essentially a high schooler. Now I want to move on to the what happens at this stage part of the chart. Now we're not going to memorize this. Instead, we're going to learn the discrete cognitive concepts that they learn at the stage. And then from knowing that concept, we can deduce the rest of that entire paragraph. So at each stage, there's a particular cognitive goal that the child is trying to obtain. So from zero to two, this blob is just thrown into this strange world. They don't know what darn thing. There's not even a conception of what I am or what you are. It's just the world is just this weird amalgam of sensations. And, and the thing that they're trying to learn is object permanence. And that's just the basic idea that an object still exists, even if it's not in my immediate line of sight. So without object permanence, the infant kind of experiences the world as things just pop in and out of existence willy nilly, just poof. The game of peekaboo that a child plays actually represents this pretty well. So they start playing peekaboo when they're just starting to grasp object permanence. So the parent hides their face and then opens it up. So I almost think of it as the child laughing at the cosmic absurdity of existing in the world and not existing, which later will evolve into existential dread. But the main point here is that in order to develop object permanence, the child must have the ability to form a mental representation or a schema of the object. So by age two, you should be able to make mental representations of things and know that even if it's not immediately in my apparent line of sight, that thing still exists outside in the world. So moving on to symbolic thought. So to understand symbolic thought, we really need to understand what a symbol is. So a symbol is just any term, idea, or imagery that has a stand-in or an association with something else. So for example, a red octagon is a symbol for stop. So even if you don't have the word, you know you're supposed to stop. And for example, the cross is a symbol of Christianity. And I don't wanna make this too complex, but even letters and words are symbols because they represent something else. So with symbolic thought and the idea that things can represent other things, the toddler and young child develop the ability to internally represent the world through language and mental imagery. So from two to seven, as they're developing symbolic thought, they can start to grasp that things can have deeper meanings and that things aren't exactly as they seem, which you wouldn't be able to do if you don't, aren't able to represent things symbolically. And now the big cognitive concept that's developed throughout this stage is the law of conservation. And this actually makes sense in the setting of symbolic thought. So the law of conservation just states that the properties of a substance remain the same even if you change their shape or arrangement. So to grasp conservation, you have to understand that certain physical characteristics stay the same even though their outward appearances changes. So this goes right along with symbolic thought because to grasp conservation, you need to know that things aren't exactly outwardly how they appear. And sorry, I should just clarify, the cognitive concepts are what's developed at the end of the stages. So to elaborate on that a little bit more, from zero to two, at the end, the child develops object permanence so that they can utilize it from two to seven. And then from two to seven, they're developing law of conservation so that they can use it from seven to 11. They don't have them down during these stages. So at the end of the pre-operational stage, they've developed the law of conservation so that they can now use it from seven to 11. So from seven to 11, the child can now use operations, which is just a set of logical rules because of their ability to conserve quantities. So with the ability to see that things aren't always exactly what they seem, the child becomes less egocentric and they start to think about how other people might feel and think. And this all flows from the ability to engage in symbolic thought and that see that things aren't exactly as they seem. 
So what I think separates this stage from 7 to 11 from the next stage is they still don't really grasp abstract thought. So it makes sense to me that 7 to 11 is called concrete operational because they can think relatively logical about something like water in a cup, but they can't grasp the nuance of how complicated things like, you know, like metaphors or like politics, like how there are a lot of, uh, I don't know, weird things about them, abstract things. So I think of the goal of the concrete operational phase from 7 to 11 is really to grasp abstract thought. And then abstract thought is what the child is able to use from 11 and older. So 11 and older is the formal operational stage. So here they can grasp abstract things and classify things in a more sophisticated way and have a capacity for higher order reasoning. So with the formal operational stage, uh, thought is freed from physical and perceptual constraints. So rather than think a little bit about cups and how they can be conserved, now they can think abstractly and, and apply these concepts to non-physical realities. So let's quickly review the chart so that we have it down. So from zero to two, it's called the sensory motor stage. And this makes sense because the infant is basically just a collection of sensations and physical body movements and cognitive concepts aren't really grasped yet. And then this stage ends when they develop the ability to understand object permanence, which is just the idea that an object that isn't directly in front of me still exists. And that brings us to the pre-operational phase. And it makes sense that it's called the pre-operational phase because the child from two to seven can't do operations like math and conservation, but they still have some cognitive concepts like object permanence, but they're still not at the ability to do more concrete things. This stage ends when the child develops symbolic thought and the ability to use the law of conservation. Now from seven to 11, they can use logic on very concrete things like water in a cup. So they can apply the logic to very, very basic things, but when it comes to more abstract, higher order things, it's not possible. And that's what they develop and moves us into the next stage. So the last stage is the formal operational stage. So they develop the ability to use this logic in, in more abstract, complicated things. So let me just reinforce that again, and I'll go over the things that can be tested. So let's review one more time to get the things that we know that can be tested. So from zero to two, let's picture an infant, and it's just this collection of sensations and body movements, so it's the sensory motor stage, and they're not able to think about really any kind of cognitive con concepts. And then we have the next stage, which is pre-operational. So we picture a preschooler who's not really able to do anything logically. They're not able to do math. The world still kind of revolves around them. So they're very egocentric. Then we move on to the next stage. So that's seven to 11. So we picture like a middle schooler with the ability to think symbolically about things. They're able to grasp the law of conservation. So they're able to do some very basic or concrete tasks like uh, see water in a cup in a different cup and know it's the same amount. But it isn't until the next stage, which is 11 years and older, where they're formally able to understand these concepts and take the law of conservation and apply it abstractly and understand complex things. All right, that's uh, pretty much it. Have a good one. If you enjoyed this video and want more psychiatric education content, I'm starting to take the Patreon more seriously. The link is patreon.com slash psychofarm. On the Patreon, I'm trying to release at least a few uh, board review questions every week. And I don't worry, I promise I'm still continuing to make the higher quality stuff. Um, they just take a lot of energy and time and I don't have a ton of that. And right now making these review videos is kind of a good compromise and I have the, the mental bandwidth to actually uh, continue making stuff regularly. It genuinely hurts my soul to become a YouTube um, but I'd appreciate it if you like, commented, subscribed. Isn't that what people ask for? I, I don't know. It makes me feel dirty.